can we start? Uh, uh, so the next talk is by Professor Kim from KAIST on cross-passive dynamics of primary particles. Thank you. Um, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Chong Yeo Jo for all the effort preparing this nice program. Uh, today, I'll talk about some um, recent work on the uh, first passage dynamics. Uh, I'm trying to deliver um, essential idea what's going on without too much detail. Okay, um, what is the first passage problem? Um, this is the um, COSP index over the last five years and because of the fear of um, depression and high interest rate and recently it's falling with fluctuation of course and so if you bought some stocks a year ago then you might wonder when it recovers the original price right so in this case animals are um, wandering around a territory for foraging to find a food or shelter and we are also living in, a, in the era of a pandemic. The simplest model explaining the spread of infectious disease is that we have the susceptible and the susceptible encounters the infected and get infected with certain probability. And after some time, get recovered, right? And of course, microscopically, we have, we have uh, um, beautiful examples we have a, a diffusion control reaction uh, describing, for example, bacterial chemotaxis and finding of uh, specific DNA sequences by uh, DNA binding proteins. Okay, all these problems look very different, right? In different area, over different length scale, right? But they are in fact related and can be categorized in statistical physics as target search problem or first passage problem, right? This is the definition. This is the definition of problem. Um, we have a binary reactive mixture in a certain domain, right? Then a searcher performs underlying dynamics to arrive at certain target position or a certain target site or state, right? And then as we have seen in the previous slide, um, this is a universal problem. We experience this kind of problem every day, right? Then sometimes the searcher can be a person or can be an animal, microscopic organism, molecules, even mathematical index, such as a COSPI index, right? So um, in this business, one of the central question or key question is how long does it take for a searcher to encounter a target? which is usually referred to as a mean first passage time, right? And this is a central quantity of general interest and which we want to understand here. Okay, let me um, begin with the elementary stuff. First passage dynamics is the uh, classical subject in stochastic theory, originally formulated by Smolotrovsky and Kramers almost 100 years ago. This is the typical setup. We have a metastable potential like this, and a particle escapes from this metastable region to reach here, and here the potential suddenly changes into negative infinite, right? So this position can be considered as, a, as the location of a target, right? And we want to estimate or calculate the mean first passage time or mean exit time, the time required to from this metastable region, right? Okay, it can be calculated using uh, focal plan application in general. For example, for diffusing particle, the transition probability to find a particle position at R prime at time t, given initial condition at R, satisfies this focal plan application, right? And this is the survival probability, probability that the particle is not observed until time t, and usually slowly decaying function of time, and given by the positional integral of the transition probability. It is a first passage probability that the particle absorption or barrier crossing occurs for the first time at time t, right? 
then the mean first passage time, the original content, the quantity of our interest can be calculated by, um, by average time with a rate of uh, this first passage probability, right? Then simply integrating by part, you can see that this mean first passage time is given by the time integral of the survival probability, right? And also given by the uh, spatial temporal integral of the transition probability, right? And then the transition probability itself is expanded using the eigenfunction and eigenvalue lambda of the focal Planck operator, right? Then this is the mean first passage time according to the previous definition. Then applying the backward focal Planck operator on both sides, then you can easily see that this mean first passage time satisfies the uh, uh, backward or, or joint focal Planck equation. This is the second order uh, differential equation. So given boundary condition, it can be calculated, right? As a simple example, consider a one-dimensional simple diffusion without any external potential, right? And we put a uh, reflecting boundary here and observing boundary on the other side and integrating this equation twice with this boundary condition. Then you can calculate the mean first passage time as a function of the initial position of particle, right? In this simple case, everything just as expected. The mean first passage time is given by the time scale to diffuse over the length scale of the system with a diffusion constant d, right? Very simple. Okay, this is a picture I'd like to show when explaining a random walk in the classroom. This is a load in our campus called uh, endless load. Why? Um, it leads to a marketplace, nearby marketplace with many bars and puffs, right? So after drinking a lot at night, you have to take this load to get back to your dormitory, right? But sometimes you drink too much, too much, with too much of C2H5OH, you become like this, right? And you feel the load is winding and never ends, right? So next morning, you don't remember anything sometime, but uh, interestingly, you always find yourself in your room, right? How is this possible? You can actually prove it mathematically. I can show it. Okay, this is the starting point called linear, linear relation. Uh, usual starting point of first passage problem in many cases. So this is the uh, uh, previous occupation probability in discretized version, right? So this is the uh, probability to arrive site X, X after N step, given started at uh, X zero. F is the previous uh, first passage probability to arrive at site X for the first time in J step, right? And it's decomposed like this, which means that you arrive X site in the previous J step, right? And for the remaining N minus J step, you just simply make a returning work. Right? So this occupation probability can be expressed in the form of a convoluted summation. Therefore, it is useful to introduce a, a generating function or discrete Laplace transform, right? Then this P can be expressed uh, in, the, in, in, in the form of a convoluted integral, so simply product of uh, respective uh, generating functions, right? Okay, then now focus on the long time asymptotic behavior. Then this discrete summation is replaced with a continuous time integral and also sharp cutoff approximation can be used, which means that we neglect this integral after uh, um, this upper bound of the time scale. So the long time behavior, long time asymptotic behavior of the function can be studied by considering the limit where this z approach is one, right? Then, then this t star goes to the infinity, right? And then, now suppose that we have a simple isotropic diffusion, right? Starting at the origin. Then we know that the PDF is given by the simple Gaussian distribution. And then the long time behavior of this function can be considered from the generating function with 
z approaching 1, right? So given like this. And due to this linear relation, then generating function of f is related to the occupation priority, right? Also, this defines the survival probability. The probability that particle is not observed until time t, right? And following this scheme, you can actually calculate the long time asymptotic behavior of S, and you can find that this S has interesting dependence on the spatial dimensionality, right? In the low dimensional system, this S becomes always zero, but in high dimensional system, it becomes finite, it remains finite, right? And this long time behavior, long time behavior of survival probability depends only on the uh, spatial dimensionality, not on the details of random work, right? Therefore, the, res the probability to find your home with random work, random steps, is always one in two dimensional system. So even if you are completely drunk, you don't have to worry, you always find your way back to home. But this is not the case if you're wandering in three dimensional system, okay? Okay, this uh, dimensionality dependence can be understood by a simple scaling argument. So consider a d-dimensional random walk, then the radius explored by this random walk is given by the time to the one over walk dimension, and the total number of sites within this uh, volume explored by the random walk is determined by the fractal dimension, and the total, the number of sites Visit the number of uh, visited sites by this volume within this volume, or sorry, this one random walk will be proportional to the time. Therefore, the fraction of visited site in this volume will be given by the by the time with the power of uh, one minus d over two. Therefore, in dimensions higher than three, this fraction of visited site becomes <coughs> vanishingly small, right? and works becomes very transparent, okay? Right, so this classical subject of uh, target search or first path is dynamics has regained a growing interest recently. Um, this problem consists of uh, four elements, first searcher, target, searching domain, and underlying dynamics, right? And these four elements have been uh, extended in various direction. For example, you can consider a target search problem in complex environment such as uh, scale invariant network or crowded uh, intracellular medium, right? And also, you can think of different uh, dynamics other than simple diffusive motion such as uh, levy flight or fractional Brownian motion. You can also bring up uh, with uh, many interesting ideas such as the uh, mortality of searchers target, okay? Right, so these problem has been studied widely and extended in various directions. However, most of them considered a single particle, single searcher, right? So it is natural to extend to consider the presence of uh, multiple searchers competing for the same target, right? Suppose that we have uh, N searchers instead of one. Then in this case, one interesting question will be, is your search time still given in this way? I mean, the, in terms of the single particle search time renormalized by the number of, uh, number of uh, searchers. If so, what will be the, this exponent alpha? Is it one or any other value, right? Okay, when you have searchers more than one, then the problem becomes already quite complicated, even in the case of uh, non-interacting particles. Why? Suppose that you have uh, n non-interacting particles, right, with uh, different initial positions, then they will record uh, uh, respective uh, first passage time, right, and from the point of view of first passage dynamics, only minimum value among n uh, first passage time should be counted, which means that we need an order statistics, right? So this can be done only through a 
full distribution, first passage time distribution, right? So this is the problem we considered. We considered and non-interacting or independent searchers in a finite domain of volume V with the dimension D, right? And I'm going to skip the detail, rather focus on more recent works, but uh, you can actually solve this problem analytically. This is possible because uh, for non-interacting systems, the trajectories of uh, particles are statistically independent, right? So therefore, the probability distribution function of M particle can be decomposed into the product of a single particle distribution functions, right? So that's the reason. And also, assuming a uniform distribution of searcher, then you can show that when properly rescale, this uh, search time or mean first passage time has, uh, uh, shows a uh, uh, universal behavior. When the number of searcher is small, then the gain in the search time is proportional to the number of searcher. But when n is large, then the gain is more enhanced. So it is proportional to uh, one of n square, right? And using extensive numerical simulation, we confirm our theoretical prediction. And the simulation here are performed for different systems with um, different sizes, different number of particles, different in different dimensionality, right? And as you can see here, all the data points nicely uh, collapse on a single curve as predicted by our theory. Okay, in the previous example, we considered um, uniform initial distribution of searcher, right? But you can think of different strategies employing different initial distribution, of course, right? And as I said, important question in this business is to optimize the system parameter to reduce the mean first passage time, right? Then in that case, one important question is what is the optimal distribution of searcher, right? That minimizes the mean first passage time, right? Okay, so this is a question we would like to answer here. Now, the target position is given in the form of a probability distribution function. What does it mean? Suppose that we have a, a, a missing child who was lastly seen an hour ago here, right? Then you may guess the current position of the child as a Gaussian distribution centered around here, right? Like this. Then how should we deploy the searching squared? You can think of different strategies, right? Broader distribution or narrower or the same as the target distribution, right? What will be the best one? So in that case, um, the formulation almost remains the same as before, except that the target position is given by the probability distribution function. And then you want to minimize this mean first passage time as varying this probability distribution function of searcher position, okay? Okay, let me consider a simple case to get some idea. Here we have a target position as a truncated Gaussian in a finite uh, uh, domain, right? And the target is most probable at the center. And we have a single searcher. Then what will be your, your choice for the starting position of search? Natural choice will be the center, right? And this is actually calculated mean first passage time as a function of uh, initial position of searcher, right? And as expected, it is, it is minimized when you start your search at the center. Then what do you expect if you have two particles, two searchers? Still, is the most efficient to put two searchers together at the center where the target is most probable or not? The answer is no. Actually, the efficient way is to put two searcher separated from each other with a certain distance. Why? This can be understood by collective search, searching efficiency. If initial positions are identical or too close, then searching domain tend to be largely overlapped, right? Lowering the searching efficiency, okay? So anyway, the exact answer of optimal searcher distribution 
is a highly correlated problem and is quite difficult to obtain general answer. So in that sense, we propose an alternative approach, which makes sense when, for the case of a large number of uh, uh, searchers. When you have a large number of searchers, like a thousand or 10,000 particles, then it's not so practical to deploy each of them precisely in a highly correlated manner, even if we know the exact answer of the optimal distribution, right? Instead, we consider independent deployment, placing particles according to a prescribed independent distribution, which is U here, right? Then now question becomes uh, things like that. So what will be the optimal distribution of U that minimizes the mean first passage time, right? Then, um, okay, so this is the question we would like to answer and it's equivalent to taking the functional derivative of the previous quantity with respect to U. And after some calculation, you can find that this optimal distribution is given by one third of the target distribution, a little bit broader of the original target distribution, right? So using the uh, Langevin dynamic simulations, we checked our theoretical uh, validity of uh, our theoretical prediction. Here, for example, we considered um, Gaussian target distribution, which means that we generate target position according to a Gaussian distribution, then also generate uh, many searchers according to this uh, distribution with uh, different value of uh, gamma, right? And this is an uh, uh, inverse uh, mean first passage time renormalized by the searching time when gamma is equal to three, right? So as you can see here, ah, these solid lines are our theoretical prediction and the symbols are our numerical result. And clearly you see that um, the searching time is minimized when the gamma is equal to three as consistent with uh, our theoretical prediction, okay? Okay, let me skip this. So far, we have considered uh, 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 target search by multiple searchers, but they are still not interacting, right? However, in many cases, rather usual cases, some form of interaction certainly exists between searchers, right? For example, think of a predator such as wolves or whales they uh, communicate with each other to locate or hunt down a prey, right? More importantly, the uh, first passage dynamics was originally proposed to describe chemical reaction of molecules. And we know that molecules experience various kinds of uh, interaction, right? Renaissance potential or DLVO potential. Anyway, so this is the question we would like to answer or understand. Here, how does the mean first passage time depend on the interaction, right? And actually, in many body system, rigorous consideration of uh, uh, interaction is always non-trivial, and has been one of the fundamental questions in theoretical study, right? For example. Let me remind you of uh, how we describe uh, uh, um, the effect of interaction on the uh, equilibrium pressure of real uh, interacting gas system in graduate uh, statistical mechanics course, right? So we know that for real gas, the pressure is given in the form of a virial expansion, right? So in order to derive that simple equation, what we have done like this, we consider canonical partition function for n particle system where the uh, Hamiltonian is given like this. P is a momentum, U is a interaction potential. Then the momentum integral and config positional integral can be done separately. This is the configurational integral, which is further expressed using moment expansion and U zero here indicates the uh, uh, average with respect to non-interacting system, right? Then to calculate the thermodynamic potential or thermodynamic function, log of partition function should be considered, 
which is expressed in terms of uh, cumulant expansion, right? All right, but this cumulant expansion or moment expansion still perturbative approach, which means that they are valid only for weakly interacting system, not so practical for strongly interacting system, such as a system with hard core potential, right? So in order to consider general form of interaction, you have to do some kind of a partial resummation, right? Summation of all two point clusters, for example, in low density limit. Then you can see that all reducible clusters subtracted out in the variance and only irreducible clusters remains in the final expression in the virial form, right? And this kind of uh, expansion is a little bit complicated to do in a canonical picture. So usually we take, um, we consider this uh, cluster expansion in a grand canonical system, right? That's what we learned uh, in, from the textbook, right? And, and the, at the end, then you can show that the uh, equilibrium pressure of uh, interacting gas system is gi given uh, in, the, in the expansion uh, in powers of uh, density, right? Okay, then, so this is a kind of a brief review how to deal with the interacting system. Now, let me get back to our original problem. So, we have an interacting Brownian particle searching for a single target in a finite domain. So this is a dynamical problem, right? So in order to estimate uh, or calculate the mean first passage time, then you have to solve the focal Planck equation for this n interacting particle, right? Which is, uh, of course, a non-trivial task, right? So our problem corresponds to the generalization of the previous example of equilibrium pressure to the n-body dynamical problem, right? So I'm going, to, I'm going to skip the details of mathematical derivation. Actually, we have tried, actually we, try, we solved this problem using three different methods, right? And then we obtained every time identical result. So anyway, uh, we found that uh, kind of a partial resummation similar to the previous uh, example is also possible for the solution of uh, this uh, Focal Planck equation, right? And as a result, the searching time is given in this way. So the correction to the mean first passage time for the real gas system is given in the uh, form of a virial expansion, right? And as expressed with the virial coefficient, this is a universal result valid for any kind of potential and we have demonstrated this universality by performing a Langevin dynamic simulation, considering various potentials such as exponential, hardcore, Sutherland potential, Reynolds potential of different number of particle interaction strengths and system size, right? And as you can see here, all the data points, numerical results, uh, nicely collapse on a straight line as predicted by our theory, okay? Right, so this is a summary. We have uh, considered target search by multiple searcher. And when they are non-interacting and initially uniformly distributed, then we have a universal scaling behavior with respect to number of particle. And when you have a degree of freedom to adjust the initial distribution, then the optimal distribution is given by one third of the target distribution. Finally, when they are interacting, this dynamical problem still can be solved, giving the answer in the form of a virial expansion. Okay, most important part. This work was done by my former PhD students, Dr. Sungan Lo, currently at uh, MIT as a postdoc and in collaboration with uh, Professor Chu yun He sitting over there in Busan National University. So I'd like to especially thank these collaborators. And of course, uh, I'd like to thank you all for listening.
So this uh, last result for the search time in the interacting particle, uh, number three. Yeah, so is this for th three dimension, right? Actually, or, the dimension doesn't dimension. matter. It doesn't matter? Right. I see. It's a general result for arbitrary dimensions because, of, yeah, actually it doesn't matter. Okay, okay, thank you. What if the searchers are obstructing each other or, you know, what if the searchers are obstructing each other? Suppose this was a treasure hunt and, you know. Obstructing um, mean the, you mean the by physical interaction or? Uh, however you want to phrase the interaction so that, you know, one searcher wants to get to the target before the others. Right. So there's. That, that is already. Uh, uh, that's already included. In in the, because we have, we have to do some kind of older statistics. So only the first one is meaningful, right? Yeah. So physical interaction, this kind of older statistics among the n uh, uh, first passage times are already taken into account in okay. this study. Right. Thanks. Thank you. So uh, you, uh, in the summary slide, uh, you presented uh, three results. So uh, your result number one and three, uh, can they be connected? For instance, three? Yeah, so you show that the uh, time decreases uh, with uh, the number of searches without interaction, and you presented the result for the case of interaction. So, for instance, in the weak interaction limit, can you reproduce number one from number three? But you have to be careful, actually, because uh, it is uh, uh, the video expansion, so that makes sense in the only in the dilute limit. So in order to check this kind of crossover or universal scaling behavior with respect to n, then you have to take into account uh, the next order term or actually infinite order term in terms of the density, right? So maybe another uh, approach may be useful or will be better. Well, I don't know the exact answer, how to extend to consider this large n system. So every assumption applied to the equilibrium pressure calculation in the textbook should be also applied here, right? Except that this is a dynamical problem. So can you apply this kind of idea to real situation like lost child, trying to find many people, people are interacting each other. So can you calculate B2 kind of thing? And you can, and you can give a consultation to the police, <laughs> for example. <laughs> right. So that's, uh, that's an interesting point, but uh, you have to be careful because um, it is based on still uh, small Chopsky equation or, or focal Planck equation. So underlying dynamics is very uh, random, right? But uh, in our scale, we don't make a random okay. search, right? So we make a kind of a directed motion, right? And we have also long distance uh, communication method, right? So in real life search, Maybe you can apply that to the, some kind of a searching algorithm for, for, for drone, something like that, but not for human, I guess. Uh, I have a question for your number two. Uh, can you intuitively understand why the optimal distribution should be broader than target distribution? Um, actually, that's a partly can be understood by this uh, collective searching efficiency, right? So it is a diffusive motion, right? So it is highly, uh, uh, there is a high um, non-negligible probability that the searching domain can be overlapped, right? So on the one hand, it is uh, better to minimize this uh, overlap searching domain and on the other side, you want to put your resources at the uh, target position where the uh, target is mostly expected, right? So this is kind of a balance between the two different uh, opposite behaviors. So the exact number of uh, three, uh, one, one, one third, uh, well, I don't know the, the, the precise argument, but the qualitative argument is like, just like that. Thank you. I also have a short question. <laughs> so th these are uh, expected uh, time for search, condition no success. 
in higher dimensions, there's always a probability of failure, right? Is that correct, Sorry. In, in more than two dimensions, uh -huh. three and above, mm -hmm. there's always a finite probability of failure that you don't find the target, is that if right? You are, if you're working in the infinite space without any boundary. Okay, so this is all? In finite system. Confined, finite okay, system. thank you for the clarification. So, so just a technical question. Uh, so this video coefficient, uh, so this result was uh, obtained for uh, without any boundary conditions, just free space in three and two and one dimension, right? Actually, we have, uh, in order to get some, some um, numerical simulation, you have to put boundary. Otherwise, uh, you know that uh, there is a certain probability up to infinite time your searchers right. do not find the So, so then, then the, the, the video coefficient itself is actually boundary condition dependent. It is known that uh, if, if you assign some boundary, then it's like uh, you are applying to some sort of uh, potential field. So your the whole particle is actually not only interacting, it, it actually uh, interacting particle actually feel the, I mean, potential uh, to each other. But if you set the boundary, that's uh, actually acting as another potential field is such that you have to reformulate your VR coefficient. Like P2, uh, this is uh, uh, known for the engineers, <laughs> as far as I can tell. Yeah, yeah, but actually uh, we are looking at very uh, dilute limit and uh, very uh, small number of particles in very large system. So uh, thermodynamically, this boundary condition shouldn't be so relevant in cases. Otherwise, yeah, let, let know, I mean, some, some sort of confined if you consider very anisotropic uh, space, then it might be true, right? So like a very long cylinder, some, something like that, or, or some, some space between the plate, then the boundary condition can be relevant. But uh, if you think of uh, very uh, isotropic space, then, with, uh, then I think uh, uh, it will be very difficult to detect uh, any boundary effect in the virial coefficient. So that is the usual the thermodynamic limit we consider, right? So volume and number of particles, both of them go to the infinity, right? With a finite density. Okay, let's uh, thank Professor Kim again. Thank you.